Well, if you have your Bible, um, if you would uh, open up to, oops, sorry. If you'd open up to Luke chapter 24, and uh, I gave you a little study guide there. So after you open up to Luke, uh, let me just let you peruse that for a quick second there. And there are uh, books from Genesis to Malachi, or Sebastiano says Malachi, the Italian prophet, right? <laughs> Malachi. Um, so uh, after opening to, up to Luke 24, take a look just real quick um, at, at this reality, because uh, where do most people run to when they want to read about Jesus in the Bible? Right? Do they go to the Old Testament or the New Testament? They go to the New, right? I, I mean, I know some people, they don't even read the Old Testament. I can't understand it. All there's dates, you know, this guy begat that guy, that guy begat that guy, and I begat lost, right? So, <laughs> um, so most people don't read the Old Testament, unfortunately. But you have to neglect two-thirds of the Bible to do that. Two-thirds of the Bible is the Old Testament. Um And so, uh, how many look for Christ in the Old Testament? Do you see the Old Testament as chock full of Jesus on every page? Um, And so, just take a quick peek, and and I'm going to ask a couple people to give me some feedback. Which one of these here, from Genesis to Malachi, most resonates with you as far as Christ being in that book? I'll I'll just give you a minute if you could look over that. I, okay, Book of Isaiah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like uh, Ruth, I'm sorry, our Redeemer. Ruth, Redeemer. Robert. Um, Exodus, the Passover Lamb. Amen. Uh, Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-one, which says, uh, "The days are coming," says the Lord, "that I will have a new covenant, not the covenant which which you broke." And. Uh, to get out of the rest of the coast. Well, amen. You're better than Joe Biden. He says, ah, you know what it says. <laughs> oh, you know the thing. <laughs> you know, whenever he reads the book of Palms. <laughs> Ezekiel 36, the same. Ezekiel 36, right? And, and so the Old Testament really is just chock full of Jesus. Now, in... I know I mentioned uh, on every page, he's in every book. Um, and so uh, he's there in the book. He's there. The gospel is present all throughout. Um, and then, of course, we take the light in the New Testament. and It could shine upon uh, the Old Testament. So it's, it's right there. Um, the entire Bible is about Christ. Uh, it's, this is not something that... Uh, was just newly invented by by Christians, that they started a new religion. No, it's always been here. Um, The Gospels state he's here. The book of Acts proclaims him. The epistles explain him, and Revelation says he's returning. So there you have it. There's the Bible in a nutshell. Now we could all go home. All right. Um, Steve Lawson said the Bible is a hymn book because it's all about him. It's all about him. So let's look at our our watershed text this morning. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 44. It says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And I want you to pay attention to the details because all these details are important. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger? In Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, 
who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God, and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, and all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where he was going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us? while he talked with us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told about these things that had happened to them on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now as they said these things, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you. They were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do you, what does doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said these things, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Well, amen. Good stuff. Jesus in all the scriptures. So Jesus had resurrected and walked with disciples on the road to the village of Emmaus, because they did not believe the woman's witness about the empty tomb, and they called the angel's words nonsense. If you look back in verse 11, and like us, they had ears to hear, but they had not heard God's word. Jesus had earlier prayed, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth in John 17, 17. Our growth towards spiritual maturity begins reading and heeding the word of God. And Jesus is teaching about Jesus. Jesus is teaching about Jesus. The living word is exegeting the written word. The living word is exegeting the written word. So let's unpack this a little bit here. Okay. Of course, we're to rightly handle the word of truth. And, and that includes in the Old Testament. Okay, and that means to cut it straight like a tent. And so we see here, the first thing is, we see the presence of God. Number one, on your study guide, you can fill that in there. It says, Jesus drew near. He drew near to them. They didn't draw near to him. He came near to them. He approached them. He made the first move. Just as many people say, I chose Jesus. Really? When Jesus said, <laughs> I chose you, you didn't choose me. You'd have we would have never chosen Jesus. Nobody would have chosen Jesus unless he first chose us. And so he draws, he draws near to us. In Psalm 65 and verse 4, it says, Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. He chooses and he brings us near. Psalm 73 verse 28 says, but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of all your works. He draws near to us. 
Why would a wicked, filthy sinner want to be near Jesus? That's like a bank robber wanting to be near a police officer, right? With the money bags in his hand. I mean, you want to get as far away from righteousness as possible. He must draw near to us, right? There was a day when he drew near to you for the very first time. And you realize you were filthy and dirty, but, but you knew you needed him because he drew, he drew near to you. He opened up your heart. And so then we see the next thing that takes place. We see the power of God. Now, this is very unique because in verse 16, it says, but their eyes were restrained. They were kept from recognizing him. Now, that's important. That's, that's very important. Uh, it really means to be powerfully restrained. Uh, when you restrain something, you hold it back. Uh, here, in, in a sense, he, he kept the, the, the eyes closed, if you will. So they saw him, but, but they, didn't, they didn't see him, if you know what I mean. Um, in, in the Greek, uh, cretine literally means we're powerfully restrained, to control and to hold. It was almost like his fingers were on their eyelids. He says, not yet, not yet. I mean, it just clearly shows he's in charge of all things. Yeah. Right when we say, "Oh, just open your heart to Jesus," no, he—if he's closing the eyes, you can't. How, how can you pry open the hands of the one that made you? You can't pry open those hands. <laughs> There's just no way. Uh, whose power restrains and controls the shutter speed of our sight? It's not us. Surely it's not us. Any more than the blind man who couldn't go into the temple, he couldn't open up his own eyes. Jesus drew near to him and Jesus opened up his eyes. It wasn't the reverse. <laughs> and then we know the Pharisees, they said that they saw and Jesus said, because you say, you see, remain in your blindness. Have at it. You're, you're the spiritual ones. You're the theological giant. Since you know everything, have at it. Go ahead. Act like you can see through walls, but you can't see anything. <laughs> right? They thought they had x-ray vision and they were blind as a bat. And so only those that knew Christ could have prevent, could have been prevented from seeing him. Right? Because he, he, he's, hold, he's holding them back for a moment. And it's temporary. Because eventually we see the opposite takes place. And, and why does Jesus do this? What does this teach us about Christ, the fact that he restrained their eyes? Anyone? What does this teach us about Christ? He's in control. Partial control. Total control. Full control. <laughs> control beyond man. Control beyond all humanity. In control of not just one, but both of them. Right? It wasn't like one saw and one didn't see. Uh, he said, your eyes are closed and your eyes are closed. It wasn't like one was weak and one was strong. He said, oh, I, you, I, I can resist. <laughs> right? Resistance is futile, as it were. And we see that Christ begins to probe. Number three, the probing Christ. Uh, in verse 17 through 19, uh, he starts to ask them questions. Now, whenever Jesus asks questions, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Right? We see in the Old Testament, in Genesis, Adam, where are you? Jesus asked, Adam, where are you? It wasn't like, I, I met a guy in the streets in Harlem one time, and he said, you know why God asked that question? Because he couldn't find Adam. I said, really? So the bush that he created, and that he saw at all times, and he sees everything at once, he couldn't see Adam behind the bush that he made, and you really believe that what you're saying is true? The God of the universe can't see behind a tree or a bush that he's made. You're really going to hang your hat on that? <laughs> oh, man. If you believe that, I could sell you a bridge. Um, and so he says, what conversation? What are you guys talking about? What things have taken place? The unrecognized Jesus probed their conversation. And what he's doing, he's just kind of, he's reeling them in. Right? He, he throws the hook out. What conversation? And he, he's just reeling them in. <laughs> their response, though, is laughable. 
right? And we would have responded the same way. So we can laugh at ourselves. Are, are you the only one in all Jerusalem that doesn't know what took place? I mean, he was, he's the one who, who knew what took place uh, on a theological scale uh, as well as a physical scale. I mean, no one understood what took place more than Christ. Matter of fact, he knew it was going to take place before it happened. Yes, Dan. He told the disciples numerous times what was going to happen, and they didn't believe him when he told them. There you go. <laughs> he put his cards out on the table. And now they're like, huh, I guess the show's over, right? Because when Jesus was in their tomb, all their hopes and dreams of messianic kingdom and Jesus sitting on the throne and kicking Caesar off the throne and King Jesus can put the Romans under their thumb. I mean, all of that was kind of buried in the tomb with them. You know, it was a nice ride, but the show's over. You know, let's put the Monopoly game away and, you know, let's go to bed. <laughs> it's over. But Dan's right. Numerous times he told them, he told them, he told them. And now it's happened and they don't see it. What things? What conversation? What's going on? And he does this for a reason. Why do you think he draws this out of them? Why do you think he makes them tell him all of these things? Why didn't he just say, hang on guys, before you open your mouth, let me tell you the deal. Why do you think he does this? Mike. So that they can bring it to remembrance. Okay. So they can... Okay. Yeah, okay, there you go. Had to be this way. Make them think, make them ponder. And then in verse 25, I, I use the word penalize because uh, I couldn't think of a better word here. <laughs> uh, he kind of penalizes them. Um, it's, it's where he says here, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Wow. <laughs> I mean, talk about coming out of left field. They're kind of telling what happened. He takes a monkey wrench and he just shoves it in the cranks. You're foolish. You're slow to believe. This was the man who apparently one second before, this was the only guy that didn't know what was going on. Now you see, <laughs> he flipped the script on them and he's starting to show them, I'm the only one who knows what's going on. You, you should know better and you don't. <laughs> so let me take you to school. And so what we see here is that uh, he, he asked this rhetorical question and, and not for disbelieving the evidence of the resurrection, including the witness of the women. And of course, the witness of the women was not worth too much in those days. But we know that the scriptures had to be, um, has to be accurate. And one of the reasons that we could point to is that the witness of the women was kind of, it, it was uh, inadmissible in court. You wouldn't listen to, if a woman came up with evidence, you wouldn't even bother listening to her. And who wrote? The scriptures, it was the women or the men, right? So the men wrote embarrassing testimony about themselves. <laughs> so it, if most of us would have written this, we would have written something like the women went to the tomb and they didn't know what was going on. And, and, and we went in and we realized what they couldn't figure out. And, you know, and then eventually Jesus met us on the road. and He commended us for our great faith. You know, that, that, that would have been how we, we would have written it. <laughs> but when they wrote what they wrote, it, it was embarrassing to them because the women believed. They weren't slow to believe. They were quick to believe, but the men were very slow to believe. And so as we look here, uh, he rebukes them for reading the scriptures without understanding and belief. They looked at the scriptures their whole lives, and yet they never saw Christ in the scriptures of the Old Testament. They missed it. How many books in the Old Testament? 39. 39. In 39 books, they didn't see it. Right? <laughs> Not just Genesis, but all the way through Malachi, and they still didn't see it. Two-thirds of the Bible is the Old Testament. With that huge chunk, they couldn't see Jesus. 
I mean, is there is there enough evidence there? Right? I mean, he couldn't have given him any more evidence. It's all there. <laughs> and yet, they don't see it. The disciples' problem is not one of the head. It's one of the heart. They're not believing. They're not believing in those 39 books and accounts that, as we looked at in the very beginning, that he really is in every book of Scripture. We see the perfect unity of Scripture, and I, and I really love this. Uh, it's a meta narrative of the Christ event. And so Jesus interpreted or he exegeted the Old Testament, making it crystal clear it's all about him. Would you feel comfortable speaking to a Jew, never touching the New Testament initially, and just saying, let me show you where the Messiah is? He's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. Hang on, there's more. He's here, he's here, he's here. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's really all over the place. And he uses a very large text, Moses and all the prophets, <laughs> right? He uses Moses and all the prophets. Now, I'm, I'm thinking that he didn't kind of go through the whole Old Testament, but he kind of stopped at certain points. Uh, there's perfect unity in the scriptures, the Greek word graphe, the writings. All the prophets spoke with one voice, no contradictions, not speaking out of both sides of their mouth, one didn't say this and another one said that. No, they all spoke with one voice. This was one message, one consistent and everlasting truth. If you took 10 people, the same age as you are, threw them in the room and said, what do you think about abortion? Would they all have the exact same view? What do you think about homosexuality? What do you think about politics, right? But it's not like that, that way in the scriptures. They spoke with one voice without any contradictions. We can't even do that with contemporaries who live in the same block, let alone these people lived vastly different lives at vastly different times, right? In, and, and they had vastly different jobs. We had, we had shepherds and kings. Uh, we, we had people who went to war, people in peace. I mean, People were all over the place. There was prophets and priests, yet they all spoke with one voice. Some of them never even met one another. <laughs> yeah. Don't you find that just, doesn't that just blow your mind? <laughs> no contradictions whatsoever. <clears throat> and so he speaks about Moses, which is Genesis. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then the prophets from Joshua all the way through Malachi. Uh, both the Old Testament and the New Testament teaches faith alone, grace alone, through Christ alone. The solas are in the Old Testament. They're, it's not something like Luther made up. Um, I know uh, our Roman Catholic friends, and I say brothers, friends, uh, would... Uh, would disagree with that. They would think, oh, Luther came and made this up, and um, not the case, N not the case at all. And when a Roman Catholic asks you, what came first, the church or the scriptures? What's the answer? The scriptures, right? Roman, <laughs> Rome wasn't even a thing back when Moses was writing. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> so uh, I've, has anybody ever been asked that question by a Roman Catholic? What came first? No? All right. <laughs> it's kind of like when somebody says, what came first, the chicken and the egg, right? If they say the egg, you just say, was that egg fertilized? All right. That for another day. <laughs> yes? What you just said about unity, it made me think about uh, Paul, how he, you know, how he's in an account with Jesus. And then for three years, he's preaching this gospel. <clears throat> and he says, I didn't confer with any men, right? And then he finally meets up with the other apostles. And they're teaching the exact same message. Imagine that. Have you spoken to them? What are the odds of that? <laughs> Considering in Galatians, it goes, you know, if anyone preaches a different gospel or a different Jesus, this is the exact same message that, you know, it's the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to look at something concerning the odds actually in a minute. So we have number six, the plenary witness of Scripture. And, and plenary just means full. 
Uh, so we have the full witness of Scripture. Uh, Jesus had two main points to his sermon, uh, the necessity of his sufferings and the necessity of his glory. The sufferings and the glory. And so he displayed the whole Old Testament was about him and pointed to both his person and his work. Uh, it was all about the suffering Savior and the glorious Savior. Uh, they had missed the forest for the trees. And so Jesus had to take them 65,000 feet above the forest to see the big picture he was painting for them. So when you look at the Old Testament, can you see the big picture as you read through it? I know Ch uh, Chuck and I were speaking before and he said he's just he's just loving basking in the Old Testament. Right. I, I just love hearing that uh, through no planning of my own. I have come to realize in the past couple of months that I preach actually more through the Old Testament. Not that I don't like the New Testament. I do. But I, I just find myself preaching more through the Old Testament and seeing the truth of the gospel uh, within it. And so perhaps walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus uh, was adequate time for Jesus's little Bible study that he's doing here. <laughs> um, wouldn't you love to have been a part of that Bible study? Uh, about seven miles, I, I, I believe it would take about two hours to, to walk seven miles, uh, unless you walk really slow. Um, the average person can make it in about two hours. And so I believe he hit the high points of the Old Testament that pointed to him, um, and they sp and he spoke of what was a necessity, uh, highlight highlighting himself as the suffering Savior, because uh, that's what they missed. They missed that the cross had to come before the crown. They wanted an Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator kind of Jesus to just kick. Caesar off the throne, sit on it, and now, now Jesus and his disciples, they're in control. They're in power, right? They, they just wanted to flip the script on, on the whole ordeal with the Romans and the Jewish leaders. They put us under their thumb. Watch now. Our guy's coming. It's over for you. And that's not what he, what he did. They, they missed the whole aspect of a suffering Savior. They wanted a conquering Savior, with his chest out, you know, he turns green. He just smashes everything. But that's not how Jesus came. He came as a suffering Savior. And they missed it, and they missed it, and they missed it, and they missed it all along the way. From Genesis to Malachi, they missed it. Number seven, their perception changes here. Their eyes were opened. And their eyes were opened by the very power that restrained them. So the one that kept their eyelids closed, he said, okay, boom. Now, now I'm going to open them. Now I'm going to open them. Uh, and their perception was not their own accomplishment. They did not open their own eyes, just like they didn't close their own eyes. Mark 8, uh, 22 to 26. Let me just turn there real quick. Here we go. They came to Bethesda and they brought a blind man to him and he begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the city. And when he had spat in his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Well, what's the deal going on here? Jesus wasn't powerful that day. This is the only account where he, has to where he touches somebody and they're not instantly healed. He says, I see men like trees. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and he made him look up and he was restored and he saw everything clearly. Then they sent him away to his house saying, neither go into town nor tell anyone. So, so what happened here? Why, why like the double touch? He wasn't fully charged up that day. Anyone, anyone? Why did it take two touches for Jesus to heal when all the other times it was instant, right? The guy who couldn't walk, then he walks. The guy who couldn't see, then he sees. The woman with the issue of blood, she didn't slowly get better. She instantly was healed. Why the double, why the double whammy here? Mike? Entirely depend on Christ. Okay. Entirely depend upon Christ. Who 
Who was standing there as Jesus was doing this miracle? His disciples. And what problem did his disciples often have? Disbelief. Right. They had an eyesight problem, didn't they? Remember on the boat, Jesus calms the storm? All right. And remember they, they throw the, the net over and they pull in this huge catch. And Peter goes, whoo, thank you, Jesus. No, he falls down. And what does he say? He says, For, forgive me, I'm a sinful man. The, their eyesight was dim. And their eyes were slowly opening along the way. And when Jesus did this miracle, it wasn't just for the miracle's sake. It's never for the miracle's sake alone. It's always pointing to who Jesus is. And it was pointing to the fact that their eyes slowly opened. And just like this man, he saw men like trees. He kind of saw the, the, the blurry shadows of men, but he didn't see the clarity of the men with his eyes. Many times they saw very blurry and they were just like the blind man that Jesus hit him twice before he could see. And sadly, many times you and I are just like that, aren't we? We look in the scriptures and there's things we don't see. And there's things we're to believe and many times we don't believe it right away. Right? And of course, there's an aspect of spiritual growth. Even when children are born in the natural, they, they can't see at a distance. They, I believe they only see shadows. They don't see absolutely clear because their sight is still developing. And so the disciples were watching this happen and it was an illustration for how they were living, even in front of the one who made them and made their eyes, if you will. If that doesn't wow you, I don't know what does. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. And poof, he's gone. <laughs> it had to be another P, right? And poof, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and so we see all of a sudden he just he just vanishes he just vanishes out of their sight in verse 31 then their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight now now that might make you scratch your head a little bit they finally see him and, and poof, he's gone? Why would you leave now? You, you, <laughs> you finally got it. <laughs> it finally clicked and now he's gone. Um, and so Jesus is in his, his resurrection body, right? And we know it from John 20, 19 to 22, he just appears in the upper room. And, and here, he just appears on the road to Emmaus. And just as quickly as he, as he appears, he disappears. He vanishes out of their sight. And, and why does he vanish? Um, does that have anything to do with that verse where Jesus says, um, um, blessed are those who believe but don't see? Okay, okay. Good, good, good verse. Blessed are those who believe and don't see. But, but, but they did see too, right? They did see. <laughs> and so he leaves them with the witness of his word in the Old Testament. And, and what is the result? What comes from that? It says their hearts burn within them. And until Christ returns for us, does our heart burn within us as we look at the Old Testament that points to Christ? Right? We also obviously look at the New Testament as well. But does our hearts burn for sports and politics and jobs and hobbies and this and that, etc.? Or does our hearts burn for this? Does our hearts burn when we look in the Word and say, I've never seen that before and I've read this at least 50 times? The same verse. All of a sudden, I never saw that Word. Maybe it just happens to me. I don't know. All right? I know Nick said it happens to him. And as you read the New Testament, can you see how it shines light upon the Old Testament? I heard it said, um, the, in the Old Testament, the New Testament is concealed, 
in the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. And so we have to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing is that Jesus and his mission to save and elect people, a chosen people, his own bride, is all throughout the Old Testament. It's not new. He called Israel his son. He called them his firstborn son. They weren't the first nation. They were the elect of God. We, we, we see it right there. I mean, it's all over the place. He picked, right? He said, Noah, I want you to build the ark. He didn't say, listen, uh, let me put out a survey. Anybody who has ark building skills? Oh, you don't know what an ark is. Anybody knows how to build anything? You know, come on here, right? He chose one person to head this project up. We see the prophets, number nine, the Psalms, the law. And so in verse 44 and 45, let's look over here. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which is written the law and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And so we see here, he opens their eyes, earlier he opened their eyes, and now he's opening their minds to, the, to his disciples to believe and to understand the scriptures. So somebody could read the words on the page, but not understand what's happening here. The person on your block who read the Bible who didn't come to faith and you on your block who did, well, what was the difference? It wasn't because you were so much smarter. I don't doubt your intellect. Because he opened your eyes. And then he opened your mind. He opened your understanding. You didn't do it yourself. I don't care if you have a PhD. <laughs> In Acts 6, uh, 16, 14, it says, The Lord opened Lydia's eyes to understand Paul's teaching. So much for open up your heart. Uh, In Ephesians 1, 18, it says, Christ causes the eyes of our hearts to be enlightened. The living word interprets the written word. And if one does not know Christ, one can't understand the scriptures. He spoke about the prophets, Isaiah, Moses, Micah, Daniel, to point to Christ. The Psalms, which were written by Moses and David, the sons of Korah, Solomon, Asaph, and others, to point to Christ. The law, the writings, and the person of Moses, all the law in the scriptures, the civil law, the moral law, the ceremonial law. Okay, the moral law would be the Ten Commandments. The civil law would be something akin to um, uh, uh, obeying uh, certain things uh, in that time period for Israel. And the ceremonial laws, the, the washing of hands and things of that nature. And so uh, we see the offerings for sin, the holiness code, and the tabernacle, and all its furnishings all point to Jesus Christ. All of it. But yet, many don't see it. And then we have the picture in verse 27, 32, and 44 to 45, which we read. He opened their eyes. Now he opens their minds. The living word is interpreting the written word, the prophets, the Psalms, the law. It's all here. That's the whole Old Testament, the prophets, the Psalms, and the law. It's all there. Now, where is Jesus? Christ is promised in the Pentateuch. All right, the Pentateuch would be another way of saying the Torah, the first five books of Moses, Penta being five. Uh, in Genesis 1 to 4, we see Christ. Genesis 22, we see Christ. Leviticus chapter 4, with the sin and the offerings, we also see Christ. 
Secondly, Christ's promise in prophecy. Now, Chuck mentioned this before, but uh, turn here with me for a minute to Isaiah 53. And there's a video on the internet, um, I'll see if I can find it, where someone went to, uh, to Jerusalem and was asking Jews to read Isaiah 53 and ask them, who's this speaking about? And some of them have never read it. Some have said that they don't let Jews read Isaiah 53. Uh, let me start at verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 10, yet it, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This is the clearest description of the atonement in the Old Testament. This is rich with theology about the atonement of Christ. It's all here. Outside of, obviously, Jesus, who do people say that this is? Israel. Israel, yeah. Yeah. So then I just asked the question, Israel died for the sins of Israel? Israel atones for the sins of Israel? I just uh, texted you the link to that video. Thank you. <laughs> when I said I'll find it, I actually had Dan in my mind, and boom, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, let's look real quick at, at um, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Psalm 22. Before Nick preaches this one verse at a time, right? <laughs> Nick, you're doing a great job, by the way. And we're really blessed by you preaching through Psalm 110. And we're just all glad you didn't start in Psalm 119. You know, Martin Lloyd Jones would have done one word at a time. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> it's on now. <laughs> uh, where were these words spoken? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where were these words spoken? On the cross. Right? Why are you so far from helping me and my words, my groanings? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear me in the night season. Am I not silent? And so you continue to go through uh, all of these verses here in Psalm 22, and you see that they're all about Christ. He's promising prophecy. In, in Acts chapter 2, where does, where does Peter get his material from? When did, when, when did Peter have time to write this sermon? Yeah, yeah, all I did was pick up the Old Testament and start to read it. This was spoken by the prophet Joel. All right? he, he speaks out of the Psalms. He speaks, of, of, uh, and then he says in verse 25, David said concerning him. He just picks up the Old Testament and he just goes through it again. For David did not ascend himself into the heavens. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If you want, and if you want to unpack that, listen to Nick's, one of Nick's last sermons. It's all there. That's out of, what, what psalm is that out of, Nick? Okay, good. <laughs> so on and on. Peter just, he gets his sermon from the Old Testament. Uh, Acts chapter 3 and verse 18. It says, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Then he says, repent and be converted. Uh, Jesus did everything in the Old Testament. I mean, hasn't he shown that he's the fulfillment, he's the Messiah? 
Yes, he has. Now repent. Now, now get right. The, the odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight of the prophecies written about him, and I believe there's over 300, are virtually incomprehensible. So consider this illustration. Fill the, inst- the entire state of Texas with one trillion sil- silver dollar bills. That, that's about two feet thick of coins. But I want you to paint one of them red and randomly mix it in with all the other coins. Then we're going we're gonna to blindfold Juan and we're going to send Juan to Texas and let him walk as far as he wants to, bend down and dig into the coins and pick up the red coin. That would be the odds of Jesus fulfilling just just eight of the over 300 prophecies that were written about him. The red coin. Yet we still have people today saying Jesus was not the Messiah. <laughs> and, and the reason is because some people say, well, Jesus, you know, he, he read the Old Testament and he just tried to use it like a script. They say, really? How did he do that whole birth thing in Bethlehem? How did, how did that happen? How did he know he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb or, or, or die between two thieves? How did he do all of the, how did he make all that happen? <laughs> how about the virgin birth? I mean, couldn't do that one, right? You know, so it's one thing if he was alive and he read and he said, all right, speaking parables, I mean, speaking parables. Behold, a man went out to Saul. And it was one thing if he tried to follow it like a script, but the, the things about his birth, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, he couldn't have control over those things. <laughs> it just doesn't hold water. It doesn't hold water at all. And so Christ is patterned in something called typology. Now, who's familiar with typology? Anyone? All right. And, and, and typology is, is basically a heavenly, eternal uh, arch, uh, archetype. Um, in other words, the, the original is copied for some purpose, but it's built into redemptive historical persons and places or things. So one thing is a shadow of another thing, right? We know that if a truck goes by, and, and you see the shadow, the shadow can't run over you, but the, but the real thing can. And so we see shadows and types in the Old Testament that point to Christ in person, places, in persons, places, and things. Uh, for example, uh, we see in Adam, right? Jesus is called the second Adam. Some say the last Adam. We see him in the life of Noah, in the life of Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Jonah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Isaiah, and we see him in, in different places. We see him in the uh, in the wilderness, at the burning bush, in a fish, in the tabernacle, the temple, and in things such as the ark, the blood, and the ark of the covenant. Now, I want to I want to flesh this out. Uh, this is absolutely an amazing thing in Genesis chapter six, verse fourteen. Just turn there for me for for a minute. Uh, I just I just love this, and I was enamored by this. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. All right, who has that? All right, Dan, nice and loud for us. Just the one verse? Just the one verse. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with fish. Okay. Can you see Jesus all over this? Not really. <laughs> Until you, un, un, until you look up the word pitch. And the word pitch in the Greek is the Greek word kafar. And the Greek word kafar is the same word used for atonement in Leviticus 7.11. Yes, sir. You mean Greek or Hebrew? Hebrew, yes. Hebrew, thank you. <laughs> She's got to make sure he's paying attention. <laughs> no, thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Um, and so it was... The same word used in for the atonement in in Leviticus seventeen eleven. That's what it's translated as. And and remember, it was on the inside and the outside, right? And why did they use pitch to keep the water from leaking in, right? Right. So it kept water out. But it also was kind of a shock absorber when, when the waves and, and I guess all the debris would bang against it. It would be protection for both things. Maybe you could use some pitch in your 
Uh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> Haul it in. Work day next Saturday. <laughs> Nick's organizing and taking names. There you go, inside and out. But but listen to this. It's the same Greek word that ha- it's the same Hebrew word that translates to the same Greek word for the blood of Christ. Wow. <laughs> And just as the pitch kept them afloat, if you will, in the judgment, the blood of Christ keeps us from being bombarded by the wrath of God. We have the kafar of Christ upon us. <sighs> Eternal atonement is provided by the blood of Jesus. It covers the believer's sin and attests to us the words of Christ a little more closely. For as in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And only those that know Christ will be saved in the last day. Wow. Anybody heard that before? That I mean, that, that just, it, it, that absolutely blew me away. And finally, Christ is patterned in the law. We see that Jesus said, I didn't come to get rid of the law, I came to fulfill the law. In Matthew 5, 17, we see him all through the Ten Commandments. He didn't lie. He didn't lust. He didn't cheat. He didn't steal. He was perfect in truth, right? He said, thou shalt not lie. He said, I am the truth. Uh, the Bible says that, that Christ would come and magnify the law. You heard it was said of old, but I say unto you, so he put the magnifying glass down. He said, oh, so you just think sleeping with someone's wife is wrong. I'm going to tell you even the thought about sleeping with that woman is wrong. You committed adultery already with her in your heart. See, he just, he continued to magnify the law. Oh, you think, you think murder is wrong? You have hatred in your heart. Magnify the law. He constantly said, you've heard of a said of all, but I say unto you. So he, he wasn't tossing it out. He was magnifying it. He was looking, he was taking that ant and putting the magnifying glass and seeing the ant in a, in a, in a huge way. This truth in a, in a large way. Mm. Remember this picture? You think they saw it as they were putting the blood on the lintels of the doorposts? And when the death angel came and all the firstborn of the Egyptians was instantly slaughtered. Their children lived. And the death angel saw the blood and passed over. Do you think they saw the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world? And this kind of stuff is all over the scriptures. Let me show you these last two. I just want to show you two quick charts and I put them for you. Uh, The law and Christ. The law is unchanging, but Christ is the unchanging lawgiver. Uh, Jesus versus the Pharisees. The, the Pharisees taught the law, they just didn't live it. Jesus taught it and he kept it perfectly because the law reflects Christ's perfection. And no man could keep the law, but the law must be kept perfectly to inherit eternal life, the covenant of works. And the sinless Christ is the fulfillment of God's law, which is why we need him in our lives, because God has to look at us and see that the law has been kept and we haven't kept it. But he looks through the blood of Christ and he says that one has kept the law. And the law must be fulfilled. Christ fulfilled the law perfectly as a man. He was he was the greater and perfect mediator than the Old Testament prophets and the priests in the covenant of grace. The law is our tutor to bring us to Christ. And here's the whole Bible in in. In a nutshell, the unfolding drama of redemption. We see the prologue, act, interlude, act two, and the epilogue. The redeeming purpose of God. There's a book called um, The Unfolding Drama of Redemption by William Scroggie. Um, I had that book. It was about this thick, and uh, it got a little waterlogged, as Dan said. (laughs) Needed some pitch around it. (laughs) Um, But here we see, right? We, We go from the revelation of the Lord in Genesis to the progression, continuing in Genesis, Malachi to Matthew, then Matthew to Jude, and then the consummation in the book of Revelation. And the whole thing is about Christ. The whole book is about redemption, the redemption of our Lord Jesus Christ.